Hey guys and welcome to your next C++ in game tutorial. Today we are going to be talking about uh, a little bit of texture caching. We're not going to actually implement any texture caching yet, but I'm going to tell you what it is and why we need it. And then I'm going to show you what a map is. A map is a data structure that I haven't taught you yet that is a incredibly, incredibly useful data structure in uh, any programming. Uh, so first let's go ahead and talk about texture caching. Right now we are storing our GL texture, player texture in maingame.h, but that's really a terrible place to store it. What we should be doing is storing one texture per sprite so each sprite can have a unique texture and we don't have to store them separately so what we would want to do is in our sprite constructor or the initialize function we want to be able to pass in what texture it loads and then it will load that texture However, what if we have a situation like this where we have two sprites that share the same texture? If we initialize both these sprites with the same file path for the texture, they're both going to actually load separate copies of this same texture. So they're both going to load a copy into video RAM like this, and they'll both be pointing to uh, those different textures. So now we are storing twice as much uh, uh, pixels in video RAM than we actually need to. And imagine if we had a hundred sprites that all had copies of these textures. It would just get really out of control. What we want to do is instead of having uh, two copies of the texture, we want both sprites to point to a single texture. And to do that we want what's called texture, texture caching. Let me type it out. Texture caching. So caching is whenever you basically hold on to some resource so that you can use it later so you don't have to you know go get that resource again so in this case we would be holding on to a texture uh, so we don't have to go get it again and uh, one way you can do that uh, the naive way would be to have like an array or a list or something so let's say we don't have sprite 2 yet okay we just have sprite 1 sprite 1 will load the texture into memory so what it's going to do is it's going to allocate uh, we'll say a vector and the first element of this vector will be this sprite right here. So uh, what the vector will, will have is it'll, for instance, have the file path in here. And my little cursor, my font size is too big. So the file path might be textures stickman or something like that. So we'll store that in the vector. We'll probably have some kind of special, uh, 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 special struct uh, called like a texture cache node. And then it'll also store a pointer to this uh, little texture here. So we can put this texture somewhere else. It's allocated on the heap. So we'll store a pointer to that in this texture cache. So now we have a global vector texture cache uh, that has a uh, pointer to our new texture and it has the file path. So now what we can do is whenever we load Sprite 2, before we actually load that texture into memory, what we're going to do is scan this global texture cache and look and see if the texture has already been loaded. So we're going to be trying, whenever we load in the Sprite 2, we're going to be saying, okay, I want to load textures uh, stick M because uh, I had to cut it off. So it's going to take this string and it's going to scan the vector. Now right now we only have one element in our vector so it's going to be really fast and it's going to see hey there's a texture in here that has the same string textures slash stick m. So instead of loading a brand new texture all I'm going to do is point to this texture like that. I'm just going to store that pointer and bam now we are reusing it. However this is not the best data structure. Uh, we don't actually want to use a vector. We could but that's probably not the best way to do it. What if we have a hundred thousand elements in our vector? Then whenever we want to look up one of the elements, we have to scan the entire vector from left to right. And let's say the element is at the very end, we have to scan through a hundred thousand different elements. Now imagine if you're loading different sprites at runtime and things like that, it could be a problem. It probably won't be, but it could be. So there's a much better data structure we should use, uh, and so let's go ahead and use that instead. There's no sense in using an inferior data structure. Uh, so first let me talk about uh, one optimization you can do with a vector uh, that makes it much faster to search for items in the vector and then you'll understand why we use a map. One of the reasons why we use a map. So this is an unsorted vector of random numbers. So we have 3, 0, 11, just random numbers and they're randomly scattered. So let's say we want to look for the number 6. If we're doing that, what we need to do is start at the left hand side and scan through this entire vector. So we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Oh, we found it. So we had to iterate 9 times. That's a lot to search for the 6 to see if it was in the vector. What if instead of doing that, we sorted the vector? So here is the same vector but it's sorted. So everything is sorted from smallest to largest. Now instead of just scanning it from left to right, what we can do is pick the middle element. So we'll say uh, 8. 
And since everything is sorted, we know that this 8 is going to have only numbers that are less than it to the left and only numbers that are greater than it to the right. Now what we can do is say, all right, the number we're looking for is 6. So what we're going to do is since 6 is less than 8, then we're going to take this section and only look at it. So we're going to basically ignore the rest of these right here. Now we're going to take this section and take the middle element. So now we're going to look at 5. Now is 5 greater than or less than 6, or is it equal to 6? And in this case, it is less than 6. So we're going to go to the right since 6 is greater than it. So now we're going to chop off this part. We're not going to look at that anymore. Let's chop that off. And then finally, we arrive at 6. And since 6 is our element, we found it. And now you'll notice I only drew three lines here. We only had to iterate three times instead of having to iterate a bunch of times. This is what's called a binary search. Binary search is really useful. It only works on sorted data. If your data was not sorted, for instance, if the 6 was over here at the end randomly, then it wouldn't work. So it's not always a, uh, a thing you can use uh, with your normal vectors, because your vectors may not always be sorted, and it may be too expensive to sort them every frame. However, there is a data structure that is not expensive to keep sorted, and that is the map. So let's go ahead and type this out. STD map. This is a data structure that's sort of like a list. It doesn't store everything continuously in memory. It has pointers uh, to different nodes and all that. And what it does is it always stores your elements to be uh, in sorted order. There's also two other kinds of maps. Uh, one is std unordered map. This is a map that stores them not in an order and it may or may not be useful to you. Uh, and there's a third map, std uh, multi map. Now with a map, uh, what you or with, with all three of these, what you have is what's called a key value store. Uh, if you've ever heard the term a dictionary or something like that, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, when we go back to our first slide here where we had a pointer to our little stickman texture here, and then we had uh, a string texture stickman. Now, in order to store this in an array, we would have had to make a whole new struct like texture cache node or something like that. The way maps work is instead of having just one element uh, per node, it's going to have two elements per node. I'm going to draw two little boxes here. So we'll say this is one element of our uh, map, one node. So what it has is it has a key, and that's a little small, let's make it a little bigger, a key and a val, or value. So the key and the value can be anything you want. In our case, the key is going to be the string. It's going to be a string. It's going to be textures slash stick in or whatever the string is. And the val is going to be a texture. So now we don't have to create some custom struct for it. We can just use a map, a multi-map, an unordered map, or whatever, because they are key value stores. So now when we want to look up the texture for Sprite 1 or Sprite 2, we look up in our map uh, with the key and what it's going to do is it's going to scan through the map and compare our key our uh, texture uh, name that we're looking for with all of the keys in the map and once it finds a key that matches it's going to return us this node and then we can grab the value which is the texture and we can point to that texture or something like that so if we go back uh, to the second slide we have std map that stores uh, everything in sorted order we have unordered map which stores everything in unordered uh, order. It, it doesn't sort it, basically. Uh, if you're familiar with Java, and you, you've probably heard of HashMap, or there, there's other programming languages that use hash maps, this unordered map is pretty much the exact same thing as a hash map, whereas a map uses a tree. And a multi-map is the same thing as a map, except you can have multiple nodes that have the same key. In a map, if we tried to create two elements that have textures slash stick m it wouldn't work we can only have one but with a multi-map you could have multiple and you typically don't need a multi-map uh, or a, an unordered map really uh, typically all you're going to need is a map so what i'm going to do is teach you kind of how a map works so you understand the binary search and there's a reason i taught you the binary search it's because a map internally stores a structure that uses binary search. So this looks a little complicated. This is called a tree data structure. So each of these boxes right here is a node. Uh, in this case, the key is an integer. So the key is just a number between, in this case, 0 and 22, or, or it could be anything, any number. And the value could be anything. The value could be a texture. It could be whatever. That's irrelevant. Uh, the value does not change the structure of the tree. Only the key changes the structure of the tree. So this could be pointing to anything. Now, the way this is laid out, uh, you can take a look here. This is the same uh, vector we had before in this second slide. It's the same one, I believe. Uh, yep, 
and it's unsorted right now. If we were to take these elements of the vector and instead insert them into a map, then you would end up with something like this on the inside of the map. This is how it stores it. This is called a binary search tree. The reason it's called binary is because each node has two children, just like a binary number has two possible values, zero or one. So we have this first node here. This is the root node. This is the beginning of the tree. And then uh, every node after that, you know, has two children. So the root has a five and a 13. Uh, the five has a three and a six. You're guaranteed that everything to the left of your node is smaller than it, and everything to the right of your node is larger than it. And unlike a map, or sorry, unlike a vector, in order to keep this in that order where everything to the left is smaller and everything to the right is larger, we don't have to keep sorting it every frame. Uh, the way maps work is whenever you insert a new value, it will automatically balance itself. This is a self-balancing binary tree. Uh, if you want to Google it, you can look up red-black tree. I'll go ahead and put that here if you're really interested. Red, uh, let me type it a little larger. Red black tree. I'm actually using a red black tree implementation for some stuff in Seed of Andromeda to uh, compress voxels. It's kind of interesting. All right, so let's look at how this works. Let's say we want to look up six like we did before. Well, you always start at the root node whenever you are searching. So we look at the root node and we say, okay, uh, we are looking for the number six. That is less than eight, so we're going to go left. So we're going to follow the left pointer which points here to five. Now five is smaller than six, so now we're going to go right, and we go right and we find six. It's just as simple as that. It's exactly the same as a binary search. It only takes three iterations. The complexity of the algorithm for searching and inserting is uh, what's known as a log of n algorithm. It is in logarithmic time versus in a normal unsorted array, looking for an element is log of n, or sorry, is O of n, uh, which is linear time, which makes it really slow. Just to show you the difference, how, how big of a difference that is, here is a graph of uh, log base 2 of n, which is the general uh, complexity of searching for something in a tree uh, or any binary search. As you can see, this is from 1 to 100. If we look over here at 100, the number of iterations you're going to have to do is almost seven. Seven iterations if your size is 100. However, if, we're, if we were using a vector, which is going to be linear time, which is just an n. Worst case scenario, we are going to have to do 100 iterations if there's 100 elements, and that would be if the element we are looking for is all the way to the right of the array. So as you can see, this is definitely a much better data structure for looking things up because it's so fast. 7 versus 100, yeah, we're going to go with, with the log of n performance. Now, the only downside of a map versus a vector is, like a list, it stores uh, nodes that are kind of separated in memory. They have pointers to each other. It's a little more heavyweight than just a vector or a list. However, it does give you the ability to do a key value store so you can look up keys and get values, uh, and it keeps things sorted for you. It's a really, really great data structure, and we are going to be using this, which is a map. Uh, or the map implements a tree on the inside. You actually don't really need to know about the tree thing. I just kind of wanted to show you how it worked so you would know. So yeah, we're going to be using an STD map. Some of the operations that STD map has is uh, it has insert that inserts an element and it takes a uh, key and then a value. Uh, and actually, I think you have to send that in as a STD pair. Uh, we will go over that in the next tutorial. We also have map find, find, and find takes a key, and it will look for the key, and if it uh, finds the key, it's going to return an iterator, and it will return the iterator to that key uh, that you were looking for. So if we were, you know, looking for a 14, then it's going to return an iterator that's pointing to 14, so we can get the key and the value uh, of 14. So say 14 is pointing to some special texture, we could get it through that. Now you'll notice at the bottom here, all of these, uh, uh, leaf nodes, these are called leaf nodes down here, all these null pointers since they're at the bottom of the tree. These are all null. Uh, it's because, uh, for instance, uh, zero does not have any children. If you were to go left, you would find nothing. If you were to go right, you would find nothing. Uh, these null pointers at the bottom, that just indicates that the pointer is null. Uh, and if you're looking for something and you reach a null pointer, that means you didn't find it. So let's say we are looking for 100. We're going to start at 8. Then we're going to go right to 13, we're going to go right to 14, we're going to go right to 22, then we're going to go right and hit null pointer, and since we found null pointer, we're going to be like, okay, well obviously it's not in the tree because we didn't see it along this line.
So what it's going to do, uh, the map at least, what it's going to do is it's going to return you an iterator still, but it's going to be an iterator that's pointing to map, map end. And end is uh, basically just the end of the map. Whenever you're doing iteration, if you'll remember with uh, lists, you have a, a, a list.begin and a list.end. It's the same exact thing. It will just return you map.end. So if you try to find your key, then you can do a check to see if it's equal to map.end to see if you found it. If it's not equal to map.end, that means you found it. So you can now interpret this iterator uh, as your texture and do whatever you want with it. So uh, this was just a little crash course on maps and binary search trees and binary search and ca texture caching. It was a lot at once. Uh, if you are confused, uh, post something in the comments and I'll help you out. In the next tutorial, we are going to actually use a map to implement texture caching for ourselves. And then we're going to draw two uh, sprites on the screen that use the same texture. All right, see you next time, guys.